after the hour, so I'm going to get us going and kick us off. My name's Brandi Gilbert, a warm welcome from our community science team. You've joined today for intergenerational community advisory groups as a tool to support research to policy efforts. We're super excited to have you today, and we have lots of great discussion and amazing uh, panelists and guest speakers on today. Next slide, please. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a few things. Um, we recently have done some community advisory group work um, based in Connecticut from our um, study, looking at the experiences of young people who have experienced this connection from school and work. And we'll be talking a little bit about community advisory groups and engagement with communities in general, in particular youth engagement. And then we'll also be just sharing real stories from our community uh, advisory group work with our um, CAG members here today. Next slide. Uh, so as I shared, here are takeaways. These are the things we're going to be hopping into. We also encourage you to um, dig into some materials that we'll share from our previous webinars. This is the third webinar and a set of the uh, series that we've been having to talk about um, the study, as well as lots of cool things about the real nuts and bolts of doing research to practice and policy work. And so we'll continue that discussion today to think about when you are doing research to practice the policy work, what does it look like to also engage people with lived experiences, in particular young people. Next slide. Uh, a warm welcome from our company, Community Science. I like to say, it's my, my usual, is that what we do is in our name, meaning that we use science, information, and rigor to come alongside and um, really along with communities, including young people, to have the changes that they want to see in their community. So that really means making things stronger, that are working well, and then addressing things that might be challenging with data information, capacity building, and strategy, all those good things. So welcome from all of us at Community Science. And here I'm going to pass off to your hosts and your practitioners today. Uh, I'm Brandi Gilbert, Senior Associate from Community Science. I lead our practice area on youth engagement and youth development. And I'm going to be passing over to our hosts, Danielle Gilmore and Don Terrace Cowens, to introduce and also um, share with you their panel. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much, Brandy. Um, I'm Danielle Gilmore. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an associate at Community Science. I co-led the community advisory group with Don Terrius, and we're excited to be here today and talk to you a little bit about not only our experience, but share some lessons and some insights. And uh, Dante, take it away. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so hello, everyone. My name is Don Dante or Don Terrius. And again, um, as Danielle mentioned, I have um, also co-led this community advisory group and um, today we do have our panelists with us today, and they can give a short little introduction. We have Diego and Ramilia. So my name is Diego. Um, I'm part of the, the research team. Ramilia, do you want to share a bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Ramilia, um, and I was a member of part of Community Science. Um, nothing. <laughs> Both Diego and Ramilia have been parts of our community advisory group that um, Community Science, as well as the Connecticut Opportunity Project with Dalio Education, um, kicked off and facilitated last year. So today we really are focused on what it means to engage youth in ways that are meaningful, but also amplify their voice, their lived experience while driving real change in community. And so that's going to be the focus of the webinar today. And we will dive into some practical strategies as well as some lessons learned on how to get more involved in doing that. But again, this is the big question that we want you all to keep in mind as we're navigating the webinar today. So first I'd like to introduce what's called the Ladder of Youth Participation. It's also known as the Ladder of Youth Engagement. This is a framework that we use at Community Science really to kind of underpin the work that we do that involves work with young people. It begins with the lower rungs of the ladder that typically involve less participation and less involvement from young people. As you move up the ladder to you know six, seven, and eight, it's more of a youth-led space. And so it's really kind of a, um, a continuum that allows for 
us to kind of think through ways to practically engage youth. There are eight levels to this ladder. Again, one being manipulation, the lowest level that typically involves things like young people's stories are being used in ways that either maybe they did not directly involved, they weren't necessarily um, given permission to, or it's very um, tokenistic in a way. So they're able to share their lived experience, but not necessarily in a way that amplifies or empowers their voice. All the way to what we have at the very top where the space is actually initiated and led with um, young people and adults have shared decision-making power. Our community advisory group falls right around rung six and a half or so, because this was an adult initiated space as the contractors for this work. However, young people were heavily involved in the community advisory group. They were core members. They also had shared decision-making power, veto power, and we really respected it in their voices and their lived experience. And so just to talk a little bit about how we incorporated community voice into the research study that we did. So the research study that we were focused on was really interested in understanding the experiences of young people ages 14 to 26 years old who were not working or in school. And we were interested in understanding what their interactions had been with societal systems such as healthcare, housing, education, criminal justice, and um, child welfare. So we conducted almost 75 interviews with young people across seven cities in Connecticut. And we were really trying to understand not only how these young people are experiencing disconnection in them with their community and amongst themselves, but also what the challenges that they may be facing, what successes they're building towards, as well as considering what their goals are and how we can provide supports for them to be able to reach what they need. And so our questions were really centered around understanding their experiences, their history, and then their plans for the future. As a part of this study, we had the community advisory group, which served as an advisory body to our research team. We felt like this was very important because the focus of the study was to really understand the lived experiences of young people in Connecticut across the, across the state. And so we wanted to bring in a community advisory group that allows for us to understand the local context, better understand the lived experiences of young people, as well as adults who are working with this population. And so our community advisory group was comprised of 13 members, nine young people, and four adults. The adults um, and youth serving organizations ser um, range from frontline workers to people in executive leadership, um, all different types of organizations, philanthropic to nonprofit. And the role of the community advisory group was really to inform our decision making along the way. It was a, it was able to serve as a checks and balances so we could we ran things by them, which we'll talk a little bit more about kind of some of the ways we engage the community advisory group. But that included things like getting feedback on recruitment flyers and um, thinking about sense making and how we're gonna analyze the data and write it up and some of the things that we were seeing. It also allowed us to have a real live kind of testing pool for us to run ideas, to make sure that what we're hearing is accurate and we're able to effectively and um, accurately represent the stories of young people. And so the community advisory group really allowed us to make sure that our findings were really culturally relevant and also responsive to the communities that we were trying to serve. And a preview that both Romilia and Diego are from that community advisory group, and they're going to be talking firsthand about their experiences. So now we're talking a little bit about what it was like to put that group into motion and kind of bring it together. And then you'll hear from the other side of what it was like to participate in that. So now, so now I'm going to talk about some considerations for those that want to facilitate or to build their own community advisory group. So as you can see, we have these four pillars or these four considerations that range from power sharing to capacity building, um, creating inclusive spaces and overcoming participa participation um, barriers. So, and we, I'm also gonna provide some, some examples of like what we use for our community advisory group, but just looking at these um, definitions. So from power sharing, we have Basically, you're preparing your organization to be able to share decision-making power with community members while fostering, you know, equal participation, you know, 
paving the way for lasting change. Um, thinking about capacity building, this is something that is very important when facilitating or building uh, community advisory groups to ensure that there is you know, authentic engagement. But with capacity building, this is where you provide community members or CAG members um, the skills and resources to um, use research effectively um, through storytelling advocacy to make um, community impact. And then thinking about um, creating inclusive spaces. Um, this is where you establish safe and welcoming environments, whether that be online or in person, where it can uplift, you know, youth voices as well as, you know, adult voices. And then thinking about um, overcoming particip participation barriers. This is where you recognize and address, you know, obstacles that, you know, members may face to ensure that they can fully engage regardless of their circumstances. So now I'm going to be talking about some examples, looking at each of these considerations. So starting off with um, power sharing, we have organizational readiness, models of power sharing, and then practical approaches. So when thinking about power sharing with organizational readiness, again, this is where you assess your organization's willingness and readiness to share, you know, decision-making power or authority with community members. This is where you think about those existing structures or policies um, that may hinder or support power sharing. When we think about models of power sharing, this is where you think about, you know, co-leadership, um, um, participatory governance or shared accountability that all facilitate authentic um, engagement with, you know, your community members. And then thinking about practical approaches, this is where you offer concrete um, steps where your organization can embed power sharing um, practices within the projects that you are, you know, um, providing or uh, to ensure or to emphasize transparency, trust building, and even recognizing, you know, the contributions of all members. When thinking about capacity building, again, this is something that's very important to, to create authentic engagement. Um, with your CAG members. Uh, we have inclusive design, um, resource accessibility, um, sustained support. When thinking about inclusive design, this is where you help your CAG members um, meaningfully participate and become you know, effective advocates through the trainings that you provide for them. This, you know, the training that we provided was with like research skills. This is like data interpretation, storytelling and public speaking. Um, these were, you know, we provided through these trainings, we provided, you know, powerful tools to ensure that they can be advocates within their own communities to create, you know, social change. When thinking about resource accessibility, this is where we equipped, you know, the members with resources like templates or workshops to support their learning um, to ensure that they, you know, had equitable access to the necessary skills. And then thinking about sustained support, this is, you know, providing ongoing membership or mentorship or creating spaces where, you know, CAG members can practice and refine their skills. And thinking about like today's webinar, we have two CAG members on call with us that are, that we've been, you know, in constant communication with, you know, to assist them, you know, refining their skills to be able to share their experience as well. So just thinking about it in that way. The next um, consideration is creating inclusive spaces. We have fostering inclusive and empowering environments. We have integrating lived experience and then also hybrid and virtual engagements. When we think about fostering um, inclusive and empowering spaces, this is where you create guidelines that within environments that are safe, respectful, and inclusive for all participants. This is where you acknowledge um, the power uh, power dynamics, um, designing you know interactions that avoid hierarchy, and then thinking about um, integrating lived experience. This is something that we really prided ourselves with within our community advisory group is where we honored you know the lived experience from you know both the youth and adults by embedding their um, perspectives within like our different trainings um, where we adjusted the discussion topics. Um, and formats, and then also like the roles that we had with them. And then when thinking about the hybrid and virtual engagement, 
especially like today where we do have um, a lot of, you know, organizations, we you do lean towards, you know, virtual um, spaces, but just thinking about like that hybrid or in-person, this is something where you promote equitable engagements. And then thinking about the virtual, you have like breakout rooms, anonymous input options, or even like moderating the discussion where it encourages participation for all. And then also like when thinking about, you know, hybrid or virtual, this to create, you know, a space that, um, you know, individuals can join um, the location where they're comfortable and secure. And then another thing that we wanted to add here um, is something that we did experience within like this creating inclusive space is we had a CAG, we had a CAG member that had, you know, younger siblings um, that, you know, attended um, to the meetings with us as well. So we had like activities for their, their siblings to, you know, partake in while we were conducting these meetings, um, because we do understand that child care is a barrier for community members. And we wanted to ensure that um, the community members were able to put their voice in the space and actively and fully engage. And then the last consideration that we have is overcoming participation barriers, where we looked at, or we had examples of, you know, logistical accessibility, financial transportation and other um, incentives, and then clear communication um, channels. So looking at logistical um, accessibility, this is where we address, you know, practical barriers that, you know, the members may face, um, that they face, and this can include transportation, flexible flexibility of um, scheduling or childcare or digital access to those virtual meetings. Another um, thing that we had was the financial transportation and other incentives. Um, we had the opportunity to you know, offer stipends um, for each of our meetings um, where we covered you know, travel expenses, we provided meals um, to show our appreciation to our CAG members or our community members. Um, yeah who may face, you know, financial constraints. But like one of the big things was, you know, to show our appreciation. And then having like clear communication um, channels where we were able to provide, you know, um, uh, channels where we can provide, um, you know, sharing information, um, reminders, and also like providing updates. And with our community advisory group, we had two modes of um, channels. We had text message, and then we also did um, emails, where the adults were more receptive to the the emails, where the youth was more receptive to the text messages. So there's trying to keep that in mind to make sure that you can fully engage with um, your members, um, no matter what mode that they want to communicate on. And then I'm going to talk about like our from our experience, like the benefits and then the challenges and lessons learned. So to starting off with the benefits, we have the value, valuable local insights. And this is where we, we saw that like our community advisory group um, had unique perspectives. They had their lived experience that helped enrich our data analysis. Um, from looking at the engagement and collaboration, this is where we had, you know, several members be actively engaged, um, offering their um, constructive feedback, you know, providing um, ideas to guide our approach to also give us, you know, a good insight of like the communities across Connecticut. Um, then another benefit was compensation and time and of their time and effort. So by us offering the um, stipends, it um, showed like our appreciation and um, for their commitment and time, but it also, you know, fostered a sense of like um, respect and value for their input um, for coming in to these meetings each um, time that we held them. And then thinking about skill building and capacity, um, skill development and capacity building um, through, you know, their participation um, we offered, you know, opportunities to develop skills through, you know, data interpretation, um, the project planning, um, co collaborative decision making um, that could be accessible or that they can use for future projects or for future um, community advisory groups that they may want to um, be a part of. And then thinking about fostering collaborative connections. So with our project, we we had an opportunity to do a research paper, but we also had the opportunity to do a data walk where we held um, 
we had an opportunity to talk to um, policymakers, you know, community stakeholders, and this gave us the opportunity to have the community members provide and share their experience and their expertise um, to give another um, sense of, you know, community building or relationship building um, that we were very, you know, happy to be able to create this opportunity. So then thinking about the lessons learned and challenges, um, we have limited influence. So with our project or with our, our group, it was it, at some points, it did serve as an advisory, uh, as advisory rather than um, decision making. But, you know, there's still opportunities where we could, you know, create, you know, influence. So just keeping that in mind that um, it could be advisory rather than decision making. Um, thinking about geographic and logistical challenges. So with our team, we were outside of Connecticut. So it did kind of like the frequency and um, of the meetings were limited, but we did provide, you know, monthly meetings, whether that be in person or virtual, and especially like around like the holiday season, we did, um, cause we did turn to like that virtual um, engagements, but it was very um, beneficial because we still kept that consistency. Um, with the members. And then thinking about the inconsistent um, engagement level. So while we did have high engagement with um, our members, there were or there were moments where there was, um, you know, less engaged. So just uh, finding ways to accommodate um, to ensure that you do have, you know, fully, um, everyone to fully engage, but just making accommodations for that. And then research, um, uh, resource, intensive, just thinking about, so while we did um, have stipends and it was beneficial, managing, you know, um, you know, different types of, you know, unanticipated things such, or anticipated things such as like childcare, transportation and meals, that's something that you do have to keep in mind um, and the types of resources you want to bring to the table when you want to facilitate or build your own community advisory group. And then the last um, lessons learned was that sustained support. Um, just thinking about like when the community advisory group is over or when the research um, project is over, like how do you want to, how do you continue to engage with the members that you have? So just thinking about like how this project or with this webinar, like we're continuing to provide, you know, an opportunity for our members to share their experience with um, a larger audience. Um, which is something that's very important. So, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Oh. Harris. I just wanted to make a couple of quick additions to what you mm -hmm. shared. And we already have our first question in the queue. We also encourage others to add questions. We have a few questions for the panelists, but we're totally open to yours as well. And we'll we'll get that question later, but it was about us not being local. So what did our engagement look like? I wanted to add that you had shared um, about the frequency of the meetings, when it's not only about us not being local, but also how busy our CAG members were, which is related to the benefit side of your slide about how we paid people. And in one of our previous webinars, we got lots of questions about how we paid people. And so here um, we did focus on about $25 per hour. And I think our total payment per meeting was something like $125 or $150, maybe not to be exact. But um, one of the strategic decisions that we made is about not only paying people like, oh, you came to the meeting for two hours and that's it. We recognize some people were traveling up to an hour, even more in traffic. Um, and plus there was prep and debrief and those kinds of things. So really about paying people for the stretch that they're actually engaging, not the time that they're just present in front and then trying to pay them as well as you can within those budgets, keeping in mind that they're trading off lots of other opportunities, as well as they also have their family and other things they might be navigating to. Thanks for, for all these uh, benefits and challenges. Yeah. So now um, we're going to open up the floor to our panelists. Um, so for some panel reflections, and then if we do have time, we'll also do some Q&A. So um, starting off, so with the first question um, to both our panelists is, can you tell us a little bit about your time serving on the community advisory group and um, one memory that stands out to you the most about being involved with the group? Um, so I'll go first. Um, I think that for me, um, it was um, it was a pleasure 
you know, to have those conversations um, about education, about, you know, about kind of finding a way to, 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 to better service the kids. Um, I think that, I don't know. I, for me, it was just it was just a pleasure to, to to hear all the stories, and I think that what stood out the most about it is that I seen that a lot of the young people are still kind of like dealing with the same challenges that I dealt with as a young person. Um, I think that I related to a lot of the stories, so I think that the thing that stood stood out the most for me was like, are, are we still dealing with this issue? Are, are are we not doing anything about it? Um, so kind of like it was like an eye opening, like, you know, like to hear the young people's stories and and to see how their stories related to my story when it came to like their struggles with education and and connecting to education and employment. Thank you. Amelia, the same question to you. OK. Um, yeah. Um. So. My time serving on the CAG group. It was pretty fun and interesting for me because I do have like a few stories. I'm still young, like I'm literally 21 turning 22 this month. So it's like I'm still like, you know, like trying to like get to know myself and like um trying to be an adult and stuff like that. But it was pretty interesting, like um interacting with other people that have similar stories to me and like, you know, similar struggles. And um it was really good that I can like, you know, express myself and try to like, you know, give them opinions and options too as well. Knowing like knowing that I tried it my way, I probably I can if it didn't work my way, it probably helped like work for somebody else type situation. So it was like, you know, good to do that. My favorite um memory that stood out being in the group was um, you know, getting together and doing the data walk in actually talking about all the struggles and every like everything that's going on in the world and stuff like that and trying to like you know help people out and um seeing like everyone on the outside of our group coming in to listen to us and actually you know be interested in the things that we learned and that we're like so grateful to talk about it was it was pretty fun so leaning off of that can you talk about what challenges you did encounter when engaging with the CAG and how did, you know, we, or how did you work through those challenges? Um, one of my challenges is communicating. I'm not really a people person. And I feel like when I lost my dad, it just kind of got worse, like really, really worse. So it's kind of a struggle I'm still going through. It just, it just went back to square one basically. But uh, I'm just trying to remember, like, you know, like I'm just trying to like, talk to myself more and just like positive words basically but um that was one struggle was communicating another struggle was um you know finance and uh me trying to find my way as an adult to figure out life and stuff so yeah it was yeah <laughs> I think that for me uh, um a lot of the challenges um was was that kind of like hearing the stories um, so, so I was like somewhat emotionally challenged, um, I think, um, and then I think that, you know, I, I think for the, for the, for the team overall, it, it, it's challenging to find people to be honest about this, right, or to, to even want to talk about this, or to even think that someone cares to hear about this. Right, just um, communicate in general. Yeah, so th those are those are what I think is, is is was some of our challenges. And then the last or this question that we have is, what advice would you give to other organizations or even funders who might want to start a community advisory group or board, um, or to even do some type of engagement work with youth? What advice would you give? Um. I would say get to know the youth before like you jump right into like you know any like um business that you want to start or like you know stuff like that I would say get to know them personally so they're comfortable enough to um communicate with you and talk to you about anything to be honest 
I think that reaching out to organizations that are already working in the community mm -hmm. um, could 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 be an asset to someone who's trying to put work like this together. Because some right. the, the organizations already have relationships with the people, so it it can make it can make the process a a, a a little less daunting. But I definitely think connecting with with other organizations and. Like I say, if if you know if you don't have the relationship, then you're not gonna get their honest opinion or their or their truth. You know what I mean? They they it's just not gonna work. Thank you. I want to um, point to the chat. I see there's one marked as answer that I did mention, but I wanted us to be able to dig into a little bit more, um, which was for um, your hosts and your panelists today was, I would love to hear more about how you built relationships with the CAG since you're not local. And I'll just kick us off just a little bit there and say that part of our um, connection with our funder, Connecticut Opportunity Project um, from Dalio Education what we brought in was that even though we're not local at community science, we do place space work. And so that is in many places. And it's really the framework that we approach when we go to a place. So that's understanding how context matters, how you approach place, how you understand who people who are local, how you also do what um, Diego and Ramilia were talking about. It's like leverage trust of the trust that's already going on on the ground. And you become a trusted partner that's part of that network, as well as um, like personal and familial connections that even we had in the team, um, including myself to the area, so that we already had lots of connections, even though we weren't local. And then I also want to pass it to you all. So for Danielle and Dontarius of like the strategies that you were using to I think it's related to our questions around like how do you build relationships and how do you build connections regardless of where you might be. And then for Ramilia and Diego, like how did it feel? I mean, in the beginning, none of us knew each other. In the end, we had come a long way. So like how did it feel for you to build relationship and build community or or not if you would hope to build more? Um I can definitely say thank you to everyone that the leaders on the CAG member for, you know, being yourself and, you know, pushing yourself to communicate with me in order for me to like, you know, get comfortable and mm -hmm. communicate and talk with you guys, because I am a very hard person to communicate. Like if I'm not interested, I am not going to talk. So I really appreciate it. Um, and if it wasn't for you guys, I really wouldn't like, you know, mentally be where I am now um, or like even like just physically and emotionally. I feel like you guys humbled me a lot more, especially like, just the, pro the project we work on. And just like, you know, even though like, you know, some situations are worse than some. Um, um, I definitely like I I we when we did the research when we did the research and um we talked about it and went over and stuff like that it made me realize like um i'm not in the same boat as everyone but i should like you know put myself in their shoes and know what they're going through because you know not everyone is like um you know a bad person or whatever the case is they're just probably going through something so you have to communicate with them and have a listening ear with them to understand and see where they're coming from yeah, I think I piggyback off of what she just said. I think the young energy was dope. You know, I think that you guys, you know, yo hunt us down. You guys was like yes. on us, and and it was it was just it was just it was just dope. It kind of felt almost like like family, like friends, right. community. Um, you know, every time we got together, you know, if, if the food was bad, we joked. If the food was good, we had a good time. But it was always, you know, it was always great vibes. It was always, yeah, it was always good vibes. And everybody just, like, you know, just was their self and was to be able to, like, you know, instead of, like, you know, trying to put on this fake mask and not be who they know they really not, um, they really are, they decided to be their self because they were comfortable enough to do that with you guys. Yes. Big ups. That's good to hear. <laughs> All of that was very intentional. So... <laughs> As we planned each meeting, Don Terrius and I through not only what capacity building and kind of lessons would fit well for the session and the, the material for the day, but we also were intentional about bringing in food, bringing in um, 
icebreakers, games, things that allowed us to get to know one another while we were in person in that valuable time. We had a Christmas party or sorry, a holiday party. <laughs> we had, a, we had a, a holiday winter party. We had a summer kind of end of the year fest as well. So just also getting together to kind of have those fun times. And then between meetings, I actually had a second phone um, that was dedicated solely to communicating with the community advisory group members. And so I was the one sending them multiple text messages, phone calls. We also followed up with email. After every meeting, we um, would send out a list of like the slides that we covered, the materials, the resources we shared. And we were also very engaged in how to make the best out of the moment. And so we would ask things like, hey, the meeting is coming up. Who, what are you all craving today? What, what are you guys wanting to eat, right? And so it wasn't just us coming in kind of imposing how we felt, but also being able to recognize like that when you do this work and you do it well, you bring your full self to the work. And that allows people to also bring their authentic selves. So we started each session with group norms, which we revisited multiple times. And again, like um, Dontaria said, we had toys and activities for people who had small children. We also just made sure that in order to do this work and make it fun, you have to make it accessible. And so it was really important for us to be intentional about how we kind of chose to use the time that we had together. And then in a virtual space, we didn't shy away from also using some of the same engagement techniques, breakout rooms, icebreakers, minty polls. Um, we even had a group chat that I led with all the young people. So anytime there was like announcements or different things, I could send that out to everyone. And so we were also intentional about continuing communication and engagement between meetings, especially since we weren't local, that still allowed us to have a presence in the community. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Don. Yeah, I was gonna say like everything that Danielle stated is like, that's what is, we are very intentional about, you know, creating a, a space for, you know, the members to engage. And then also for us to get to know like the community, um, better as well um it was my first time coming up to connecticut i didn't have any you know idea <laughs> of what the the senior is like i was always talking about i might need a, a big jacket you know what i mean i was asking about the winter time um but like how diego and Ramilia said like it was like a family like everyone we while we did work we also we relationship build which is something that was very important and then it made the whole process it made the project better or more insightful um and richer so we were very explicit about that. Even in the beginning, we had a whole session where we asked people to interview one another so they could get a chance mm -hmm. to get to know each other better. We asked questions about people's communication styles. What do you prefer, phone, text message, email, what time of day, all of those things so that it allowed us to really tailor the communication strategies for each person to the, so that we didn't have a one-size-fits-all approach. We had an all-size-fits-all approach in which we kind of really were intentional about tailoring the communication styles to what worked best for the individual based on kind of some of the information that we had learned about them in the earlier sessions. Yeah, and I want to add, if you are a funder or a nonprofit or even an advocacy organization hoping to do this work and maybe you're newer to it, to say that it was logistically and um, also in terms of budget, it was robust. And so, you know, big props to our partner at um, the CTOP group at Dalio Education when in the beginning when we had this idea to have the CAG and it grew into something more robust and we needed the time to do all these things, they did hop in and say like, hey, let's do more capacity building let's increase the budget. And so what Diego and Ramilia were feeling were that there were lots of resources pushed in that allowed our team to move in terms of backups um, and, you know, to really collaborate to move this. It wasn't, it wasn't a small effort at all. And related to that, you have two other questions in your queue, but also in your like pre-queue, the questions that came before, there was a related question about um, barriers to participation and like logistically um, that some CAGs really have a hard time keeping people there. So I wonder just to kick off to Diego and Ramilia and then um, to Danielle and Dante, sort of like what kept you there? And also, is there anything around kind of like the logistics nuts and bolts that help you to show up in the space? I think that for me, what kept me there is like, like we, I felt like I was doing real work. Like, you know, I, I felt like maybe the work 
that we're doing it, it, it is gonna it's gonna it's gonna really affect change like that's how I was feeling or that's how you guys have me feeling and then I think that you know like even my experience of of, of you know of working with the Dahlia Foundation I know that they're a powerful group you know what I mean and if and if you know they're involved then then there's gonna be ears to 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 listen so I I thought it was a it was a, a powerful moment to be able to contribute to something that could maybe affect change at one point or another. What kept me there? Yeah. Was um I was very interested. Like I was locked in. Because driving 45 minutes every chance I get crazy. <laughs> but I was very um locked in because I was interested. And not only that, but um I'm a part of the OPP team and I'm a youth so it allowed me to put myself in the staff's shoes to know like this is what they're dealing with on a daily basis with students I mean not students youth sorry this is what they're dealing with on a um, daily basis with youth and trying to like you know get to know them and figure out their ins and outs of why like you know their lifestyle is set up the way it is and stuff like that and trying to find ways to help them so it was like a good it was a great experience for me to like um you know have me look at like just flip it basically like being the helping hand and it made me I'm in school to be an MA I'm gonna finish but I definitely want to go back to school for either criminal justice or um social work so it did make me kind of figure out a way to go back to school and you know figure out what I want to do and again I thank you guys <laughs> So part of the reason why the work felt so impactful is because it was. So Ramelia earlier mentioned a data walk. So what we did after the research study was over, we paired with the community advisory group and we went to the um, Connecticut State Capitol building where the legislators met and they while they were in session. And we shared our research in a way that allowed us to kind of walk through what we were what we were presenting across the different systems that we saw. And that work actually led to the passing of House Bill 5813, which was a, on the floor at the time, which is a bill that was focused on setting up a commission to really help understand the influence and the impact of disconnection in Connecticut with the goal of reducing the number, which was approximately around 119,000 students and young people that were experiencing disconnection and getting that number to a functional zero or as low as possible. And so the work did really have meaningful impact. Um, and so we we do appreciate the influence that you had and then the things that you were able to kind of contribute to. In terms of like meeting and logistics, I mean, we tried to be as geographically central as possible because we did have um, the research study was looking at seven different cities across the state and so we wanted to be able to have representation from people from various neighborhoods and so that did require some people to drive and so we I was very intentional about scheduling Ubers, Amtrak tickets, train tickets, um, things like that that allowed people to get there closer. We also um, in addition to the stipend that was um, funded by Dalio Education, we also provided transportation. So money that was set aside for costs that could be used for gas, childcare, other things. And so it was kind of a discretionary fund that, that we provided on top of the stipends that we provided to allow people to kind of also overcome that. Um, and I saw a question about how often we met and we met for about two hours, either virtually or in person. It was about two hours each time. And it was about a year long engagement. You also have a question here about how do you recommend overcoming sustainability challenges? I would say first and foremost, when you think about sustainability, you have to start with the, with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. And so from the very beginning, as you think about co convening a group, you know, thinking about 
what you want them to come together for, the purpose, what the engagement will look like. It's also important to think about what sustainability looks like then. So I would recommend starting to think about it from the beginning. Um, that also allows you to build in ways that are meaningful and allow for you to kind of sustain the group. And so sustainability, not just in terms of funding, but also what does it look like to maintain relationships? What does it look like to maintain engagement after the, if the project is over and you're coming together for a discrete task, then, you know, clear communication around this is a discrete task. This is a purpose we're coming together for. And then allowing for there to be, you know, a, um, a phased out kind of disbandment and right, rather than just stopping things kind of abruptly. And so I would say in terms of sustainability, those are some of the key considerations that I would recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, same same and just thinking about like with our two members here today it's like you know you know having that sustained and like you know having that ongoing you know communication is something that's important and like how daniel said it's like thinking about the end in mind is something that's important when you are doing this type of work um because you still want to create change and then you can we still can provide you know resources or you know build relationships you know as they continue to grow and continue to make an impact in their communities. And I mean, right now is a perfect example. The community advisory group has finished, but we're still finding ways to engage members to allow them to share their stories. And so sustainability looks different for every community advisory group. It may look different for your community and what that looks like, but also thinking about ownership and being able to see if you know people want to sustain and those who do finding ways to meaningfully allow them to still contribute. Exactly. Um, Ramilia and Diego, I wonder if you might also talk about sustainability, even though we don't have our CAG up and running as in meetings, but what has it looked like for you? Like, what have you taken away from the CAG and how does that shape the work that you do now? Especially since you both have connections to organizations that have been involved in this work and then also your your personal connections to the work. I think that I think that for me, um, I've been able to kind of like, like have something to reference to like so you know like after we was meeting and we was hearing all the stories and and we kind of like was coming up with with ways of sharing it of ways of putting it together i think it 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 gave me like like it affirmed a lot of the things that 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 i was thinking or that i was feeling about about education um and when you say um, um, sustainability, you mean like, how did we stay together? Yeah, I mean, some questions were about like, how did we keep things going even once the CAG was over? What does it work look like to kind of move forward? I just think that, I just think that like, like, like we said, like you guys made it feel so comfortable that it, it, it just became bigger than, than, than what it really was, right? So it feels like, you know, like, like you guys could call on us and we're going to be ready. You know what I mean? That's how, no, I'm, I'm with you though, you know? And, and it's not about, like, for me, it was never about no stipend, about no money or nothing. It was really about really trying to get the message across, right? Or really trying to find some type of solution or, or, or maybe get someone to hear us out so that they could figure it out for us. I mean, whatever it is that that is going to do, that is going to affect change because we know that we're struggling. So it 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 is it, is like the state the sustainability I think come from how you guys put it together and how you guys kept us together and then how you guys kept us engaged and you know and like you said you know all the little tricks you guys did they they kind of helped us feel comfortable so it was it was a great thing. I'm always here, <laughs> <laughs> even even when I'm busy, I'm always here. I don't know. I really, to be honest, I don't really know how I do it, but I just know for a fact, like, if it's really important to me and um, it's something that I really have to do, I'm going to get it done. So I could be doing like four things at one time, but I'm going to make sure I get it done. That's just me. But um, sustainability, like I said, it was very important, not only for the youth, but my experience with you know my dad and him being deported for like no it was just I felt like it was his situation I feel like it was very illegal the way they did it so 
basically like example of my dad being deported and no explanation no nothing um it made me really 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 want to look into it a lot more and stuff like that because not always just about the youth because you know older people need help as well so um yeah it just made me want to like look into it more yeah thank you um, also adding that you all having your cue, um, Samantha Miller, who's our um, program officer and the lead on um, the Connecticut Opportunity um, side, as well as Dalio shared that Diego Romilia also contributed to APES um, and reports for their experiences. So just another way that um, things continue to move on along with that also like to add like the media coverage as well. There's been lots of media coverage for this study as well as the study was part of two other studies, a set of studies, one about um, best practices for this kind of work around connection, disconnection, one about just the cold, hard numbers, what are the metrics in Connecticut around young people's experiences, and then this study you're hearing about today about lived experience. Um, so the media played a big part in really pushing out those messages um, as well, and how the Delio Education and the CTOP team used the media to leverage there, including with the CAG members. It's true. Social media is a big thing right now. So I do see a question about how we advertise to attract participants to the community advisory group. I think this is where what Diego mentioned earlier is really important, having those relationships with organizations that are already in the community and working with the populations that you're interested in working with. Mm -hmm. We were intentional about not only getting adults who are working in youth serving organizations, but the young people that we did want to be a part of the community advisory group, we were intentional about making sure that they themselves had a past history or a lived experience of disconnection. So they could also speak to their own experiences and be able to share their insights. And so the um, funder for this work, Dalio CTOP with Dalio Education Foundation has lots of connections to nonprofits that are in Connecticut that work with youth who are experiencing disconnection or have a history of experiencing disconnection. And so we connected with them and we sent the call out and said, this is what we're interested in. This is what we're hoping. This is what the ask is. Um, do you have young people that you feel like fits this mold? Do you have young people that you feel like can contribute? Um, Romelia's name came up a few times. She was very highly recommended. We're very glad to have her here, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, in addition to that, we also had information sessions. So before we even started the community advisory group, we talked to young people who mentioned being interested and we said like, this is the ask, this is this is what it's gonna look like, this is what to expect from us, this is what we would expect from you, the time to time commitment, all of those things, just to make sure that we found people who were a good fit for the community advisory group. And we're in a place of stability so that allows them to meaningfully uh, participate and contribute to the, without um, hindering disconnection, because it is time consuming and so, it's important to also think about as you're inviting people in with lived experiences, the considerations you have to make for people who have lived experience. And so um, that was definitely something that we were intentional about as we um, thought about who we wanted to populate this community advisory group. One final question in your queue. And for the last five minutes, I like to have a, I always like to have a closing thought on the webinar. And so I could probably get through your full panel of Dontarius, Danielle, Diego, and Romilia sharing final closing thought, which is what do you think was the biggest success of the CAG as a group? Anyone want to kick it off? Letting it be known. Okay. Can you say more? <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like when it first started, honestly, I never heard of this group. So this is my first time working with it. But I, um, you know, actually being a part of it and, you know, me actually participating in everything and witnessing it, I start. I'm starting to realize like, uh, the CAG group, the CAG is really starting to be out there on social media, being, um, part of different, um, talks and stuff like that and you know people on the outside talking about it as well like just hearing it from the organizations and stuff like that so yeah I feel like it's just more out in the open where people can communicate and that's a really good thing so that means we actually succeeded into doing something positive so that people can talk about it um I felt that like the data walk was six that that kind of like was like a big a big thing for us 
uh, cause I didn't know that we was going to do that. So like, I mean, we did all that work and then you guys just like, all right, we about to go to the Capitol set up, <laughs> different session. That so you oh, always and seeing all the politicians, you know, that, that felt pretty powerful. That, that felt like, that felt like we was getting heard, you know? And then, you know, when we, when we set it all up and they was walking, you know, to the different little booths that we set up and they was asking us questions and, and, you know, we were answering them. It just, it just felt like, it felt like something was happening. It felt, that felt like success, even if, you know, and then like you said, you know, there was a bill that was passed um, that, that felt like success. So I, like, like, you know, like what Melia said, it, it is we're being heard. I would say for me, the biggest success that I had on the CAG leading the group was to see the transformation in the members from the very beginning, people being shy, you know, hesitant to speak. The first, the first few meetings, we really embraced um, the facilitator motto of, you know, silence can be golden sometimes. And we, we sat through some of those silent conversations and silent moments, but it allowed for us to build rapport, get to know each other. And then by the end of the sessions and the end of the, our time together, we were almost, you know, having to cut people off and like shut the time down early because it just felt so natural and people had a desire to continue. And so I would say that for me, the biggest success was seeing, you know, people grow in their comfort levels of being able to talk about some of these things, engage more and really open up and build relationships, not just with us, but with the other members on the CAG so that it did feel like a family. And then I will say like for me, it was more of like the, um, like our, like we're doing the walk, like, or like, um, what is it? Like you, we lead them by example. And then like at many times the, the CAG, the community advisory group, they led us in many of our meetings. Um, again, like they're providing us insights that we didn't have, um, any, like we didn't know about within Connecticut. Um, and then also like, you know, with the, the data walk and talking to the politicians, um, seeing the skills grow with each member, um, and then just like us relationship building, um, again, like like building that like that family that family bond and like everyone having a great time um, was something that I feel like was very successful um, for us and um, something that people look forward to um, each each meeting. They literally would come on and say like you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk to y'all or, you know, doing like, you know, some updates on the team was really good as well. So that was successful for me. Well, in the last minute, thank you all for sharing the final words. And um, thank you, Remilia and Diego for serving as CAG members and being there the whole tenure and being leaders in the CAG as well and relationship building, doing the important work. And Danielle and Dontarius for your work too and leadership in the CAG. Um, again, excited to have everybody today. Feel free to check out the series of webinars where we're discussing lots of work um, around this study. And also you can um, connect to the study report, preliminary report, and final report as well. And again, many thanks to our partner and our funder, including Samantha Miller on the line and her whole team and um, just being able to have Hi, Sam. <laughs> and do this work together. Thank you. Um, I have one more thing to say. Oh, please close us out. It's all you. I just want to say thank you to everyone that participated and, you know, stayed in contact, especially Sam. Um, for being very, very, very patient with me because my life, it seems so chaotic. Yeah, I don't know how I do it, but I really appreciate it. Thank you for closing us out. You deserve all the patience and all the love and glad to glad that that was been has been shared with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.